Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> well, you didn't have to say that, but I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Domenico Grasso, Chancellor here at uh, UVM Dearborn, for those of you who don't know me, and thank you all for coming uh, today. As you all know, we are embarking on a strategic planning effort to decide where we are collectively going to go in the future of this great institution. And as part of our process, we thought that it would be helpful to us if we could hear from leaders that have been thinking deeply about the future of higher education and innovation in higher education. And as you probably know, higher education is not a rapidly changing field. <laughs> so I think we have a lot of time to think about it, but even though it's not a rapidly changing field, we are under such pressure now because things around us are changing that if higher education doesn't change rapidly, at this particular point in our history, we are going to face even greater challenges. And one of the, one of the things that uh, is really uh, problematic in higher education is we have lost the trust of the general public. And this is something that has arisen for a variety of different reasons, whether people think that we're too liberal, we cost too much, we're too selective, we're elitist. There are so many, we don't prepare our students to, to take on jobs. There are so many reasons people have argued for this abrogation of trust in higher education. But today, we're going to hear from someone who has thought long and hard about this topic. So Rick Miller is the president of Olin College. Olin College is, for those of you who listen to NPR, you will hear Olin College mentioned quite often because they are a sponsor of NPR. And Olin College is a startup which uh, is only about 20, 19 years old or 20 years old. And Rick was starting Olin College at the same time that uh, I started the engineering program at Smith College. So we started our interactions at that point uh, in time. And since then, I've had the very good fortune of serving on Olin's uh, presidential advisory board. And what Rick did was he brought in some really thoughtful individuals from around the country, and he'd bring them in every uh, six months or so and to talk about some of the things that Olin was doing and to talk about trends in higher education. And I found those meetings extraordinarily invigorating and always made time in my uh, calendar to attend those presidential advisory board meetings. But Olin is a, a super interesting place and it's a unique place. And at one point in my career, when I was at Smith College, and I, I'm gonna give you a quick English lesson here, uh, I said something about being very unique. And for those of you who have any concept of English, you know that those two words do not go together. So uh, even though Olin is very unique, uh, it, uh, I am not going to say it in that way, but it is a unique institution, and it is an institution that is serving as a model for higher education, not just in engineering, but across all disciplines. Rick. Uh, for his part, was raised in a very traditional engineering environment. He did his undergraduate degree at uh, UC Davis, and uh, then he did his master's degree at MIT and his PhD at Caltech. And then he uh, took on a faculty position at USC uh, before there was any scandal there. <laughs> and uh, he uh, rose to the position of associate dean of engineering at USC and then became dean of engineering at Iowa. And then at, while he was at Iowa, he was tapped to start the college uh, at Olin. And he started from scratch. I think uh, Rick was there when they just had purchased land, right? So there were no buildings, no faculty, no students, no curriculum. So he really started truly from the ground up. And uh, he has accomplished many, many great things there. He uh, is now a member of National Academy of Engineering. He won the uh, Brock International Prize for Education. 
He won the National Engineering uh, Academy of Engineering Gordon Prize for Innovation in Education and in Engineering Education. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also a member of the National Academy of Innovators. He is, and he's given a number of talks around the country and around the world on this topic. We're very, very fortunate to have Rick Miller today. I'd like you all to help me welcome Rick to the podium. Yeah. Uh, well, what an honor to be here, and uh, especially to watch my close colleague, Domenico, take over leadership of this very important uh, major uh, state institution. So it's a real privilege. I do want to try to give you a, a whirlwind tour of some of the lessons learned at Olin and some of the things that we're hearing from the more than 900 universities now from 55 countries that have been through our place since 2010. So um, we, have a, we don't have to go very far to hear about the problems. <laughs> they show up on our doorstep. So see, it works, good. Um, so this is gonna be in two parts. The first one is, well, what the heck is Olin? And the second part is, so what have we learned in doing all of these experiments? Um, so the first part is, you know, what's Olin? Um, so there's Mr. Olin uh, to begin with. And let me just say that um, the Olin Foundation decided to start over in higher education out of a great deal of frustration about the way engineers were prepared in the 1990s. And by the numbers, um, when we graduate um, students from college in a month or two nationally, um, less than 5% of the bachelor's degrees in America will go to students who majored in any kind of engineering at any university in the country. And that compares with about 12% in Asia, about 12% in Europe, and about 30% in Asia. And one of the few things that the country still exports successfully is technology and entrepreneurship, which is very hard to do without engineers. <laughs> um, we're not doing very well at producing them. And our narrative about this is that, well, it's just really tough and you have to be born smart and maybe you have to have a dad who's an engineer or something. By the way, they're almost all boys too, um, which is an issue. So Olin was created uh, out of frustration by the, the uh, Olin Foundation to take the excuses away, to eliminate the sacred cows, the uh, things like tenure, um, departments, um, everything has an expiration date at Olin, including the curriculum, to try to get the breakthrough ideas to make it work. That's the, that's the idea. Um, the Olin partner year is a really special year. Uh, that's when we brought in 15 boys and 15 girls to live in construction trailers for a year on a parking lot while the campus was being built. Um, they didn't even get course credit for this, okay? They still had to start over the next year. And we told them, um, you know, come, when people ask you where you're going to college, tell them you're building your own. And then uh, come to Olin and, you know, we'll do this together. Um, and I just, I was amazed. They actually came. Um, really bright kids. So we did in that year experiments that we knew would fail. We did it on purpose so we could watch it fail, so we could actually learn how people learn and what goes wrong. Being an engineer um, from the aero industry, I have former PhD students at Boeing, which may not be something we like to talk too much about these days. <laughs> um, their plan at Boeing, and always has been, before you put any um, passengers in an airplane, you take it in the hangar and you pull the wings off of it. Okay, it's a very violent test. You do not want to be in that hangar when the wings come off. It's like a bomb, it explodes. Why do they do that? They're checking all the calculations. They want to know what it actually does when it fails, not what somebody's predictions look like. What we did in the Olin partner year is we pulled the wings off of higher education, okay? We did experiments to failure just so that we could watch them fail so we could see what kids do when you put them in crazy, uh, difficult circumstances. And we learned a ton from that. In fact, we learned more from those students than we ever learned from going to a conference or reading a paper, because <clears throat> we wouldn't have believed it if we just read it in a paper. But we knew these kids, and we saw what they were able to do, and it changed our whole way of thinking. So that's the most important thing. By the way, Mr. Milas was the president of the Olin Foundation who decided to spend $460 million to start over with a blank sheet of paper 
uh, 15 miles from MIT and tell them they were doing it wrong. Okay? And I'm the poor guy that got blamed for all of this when I showed up on the scene. Um, it wasn't an unformed uh, startup. So some of our early advisors were Joe Bordogna, who was chief at NSF during the 90s, and also uh, John Prados, who was the president of ABET, which is the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, that made the changes in the accreditation criteria called Criteria 2000. Uh, and that was in order to break open some of the barriers to being innovative in education. These, in fact, John was on our board of trustees, and he was also on the selection committee that that picked my name out of the hat for being the first person. And, and uh, Domenico's right, when I showed up at Olin, it was not yet a place. It was an idea. The Olin Foundation consisted of four people. More people. By the way, those four people in the Olin Foundation, none of them are an engineer, and none of them is from higher education. So imagine your board of regents has 100% of the money, none of them is from higher education, none of them has a content background in the field you're in. What could go wrong with this? Okay. <laughs> My wife figured that out much faster than I did. Um, so, so once you're in, it's now what do you have to do to make this thing succeed? Um, this is from the founding precepts. This is, this is the binding agreement that the Owen Foundation wrote that, that requires that the college use the money for this purpose. And if you read it, we're intended to become an important and constant contributor to the advancement of engineering education in America and throughout the world. Um, in other words, we're we are designed to be an education laboratory. That's what the purpose of Olin is from the beginning. Um, we think of it this way. So um, there's higher education, as you pointed out, is not an easy thing to reorient or to change. Olin is this little tugboat. Um, now notice that Olin is pushing at 90 degrees on the bow of the ship. And it's there for a purpose, but you don't want the ship to follow the tugboat. That's not the purpose, okay? The, the tugboat is supposed to help reorient the, main, the mother ship a few degrees to the left or to the right. That's all that's really needed. So we do crazy things, but our partners do reasonable things. That's the idea. Um, to make this laboratory, none of us at Olin has tenure. Um, in fact, nothing at Olin has tenure because even the, the curriculum has an expiration. Um, we have no academic departments, which by the way is a much bigger deal than not having tenure. I think there are a lot of innovative institutions that have tenure. That's not, you know, but at the beginning they didn't know what the roadblock was, so they wanted to make sure that wasn't it. Academic departments, though, really are um, a roadblock, to, and we can talk about that later. Um, and we have $100,000 merit scholarships for every kid that comes to the school. It used to be free, and then we had this thing called the financial crisis. You might remember that. Um, now we're less expensive, but we're not free. Um, we have now begun to interact with lots of others. I mentioned all these different schools. Um, here's just a tiny little sample of the ones that have been through, and many of which we have partnerships with around the world. Um, what is it that Olin does now? So remember, it's a laboratory, so we keep trying these experiments, and it changes. So most of the course titles that existed five years ago are not there anymore. We have completely different ways of dealing with it. And a lot of the course titles at Olin are so confusing that other institutions don't know what to make of it. Of course, like the stuff of history, okay? Or um, six microbes that change the world, okay? That's a combination of world history and microbiology. And it's taught by teams of uh, faculty from humanities and arts at the same time as you have science. Um, so this is what they do, 25 to 35 design build projects and start and run a business before they graduate. Um, that's unusual. When they graduate, by the way, and they talk to the employer, yes, they do have a transcript, but it's an, it's an appendix in the back of a three ring binder with 25 tabs that have pictures of all the stuff that they built. So, the employers think that they have a couple of years of experience, because they have, okay? One of the things that they do at the end, instead of this capstone, is this thing we call SCOPE. It's a corporate-sponsored project that takes a year. Each company is paying $55,000 for the privilege of working with four or five students for two semesters. And that's not 100% of their effort for two semesters, that's about a quarter of their effort for two semesters. 
There are uh, non-disclosure agreements. There are often patents developed. We give the IP to the company because we're not interested in creating an adversarial relationship with the company. We want authentic learning experiences for the students. The students are named on the patents. The company owns the uh, economic rights and the students wind up getting multiple job offers when they're done. Um, so the, why do we do that? Because we want them to learn to be an engineer, not to learn about engineering. You can't be an engineer unless you have a, a client that has skin in the game, and it matters. So in principle, if the client doesn't want to come back next year, you failed the class. Nobody has failed, although they've come really close. See how close you can get and still get away. Um, it also took us a while to find the right clients. Not every client company is the right one for this sort of thing. But we have another, we have a group of companies that have sponsored at least one and often two projects every year for 14 years. And they're still going strong. So there's a lot of companies that really thrive on this sort of thing. So how do we do that? Well, by the way, we have two things that I think are really important, Expo and Passionate Pursuits. Expo is inspired by a music school. So we think of engineering as a performing art. And if you had a kid in a music school, you would expect them to have a recital at the end of every semester, right? Um, every kid would play something. Maybe it's just Twinkle Little Star. Um, but they would play it. And we do this at Olin. At the end of every semester, every kid has to stand and deliver in, term, in front of the entire community. And we open it to uh, folks outside. We have two or 300 people from Route 128 that come. And the kids all have to stand right next to each other and demonstrate what they know about an important project. That turns out, you know, if you learn to play the violin and you play it on a recording for your teacher, um, you demonstrate what you know. But if you play that same piece on stage at Carnegie Hall, it changes who you are. And this whole business of learning to perform in front of a professional audience is transformative for students. I think if you did nothing but that, uh, had students stand and deliver in every course, you would find that you'd have quite a change in their uh, learning. And passionate pursuits. Um, we believe that engineering um, can be more engaging than it was when I was learning it. Um, that's important because that keeps your attention. But it still has tough subjects to study. So don't let me sugarcoat this to you. It's still, quantum mechanics is still confusing. Even, I mean, I don't think Einstein believed in it. Um, it's hard. So you need to have kids doing something they're passionate about in every semester um, so that it sustains who they are all the way through. So we have a lot of kids that come in. For example, the principal cellist in the state orchestra when they're in high school, they might go to other engineering schools and they say, Time to sell the cello now and buy a laptop. We're going to learn about Navier-Stokes equations. We tell them, don't sell the laptop. I mean, don't sell the cello. You're going to use it. And then we have funding for this. And we had a kid a couple years ago who did exactly this. Um, we got master classes at the New England Conservatory. And he played in three different orchestras in other universities uh, through town while he was graduating from Owen. Um, we want them to nurture the things that they're passionate about. And not everything that you do in science and engineering will be something you're passionate about. So those are just some of the weird things. But on the other hand, if you come back in five years, this will probably be a different list. <laughs> okay? Do you really need to do 25 to 35 design build projects to change engineering? No. Okay? I think you could probably do five and get 80% of the benefit of what we're doing. We're doing 25 to 35 because it's our mission to take things to the extreme. Remember the tugboat? It's not the aircraft carrier. Um, so that's kind of what we do. Olin is producing engineering stem cells. This is an observation that a number of people have made. Rather than taking the mentality that we're trying to create miniature PhDs in engineering, so they have the deep technical background that you would find in a PhD in some other major technical university. So they come out as being highly specialized scientists. We prepare them with an engineering mindset and a broad set of skills where they can do on their own. They can adapt to almost any environment and find a way to apply engineering thinking to solve problems that people haven't, don't even know that they have yet. Uh, and that's really um, the DNA that's coming out today. It's been uh, really quite useful, which is also, I think, easily transformed to other disciplines, which I'll come back to. 
For a long time, we wondered, how do you really change education? Because it's really difficult. I think um, Buckminster Fuller is closer to this than anybody that we found. He basically says, don't bother arguing with people about why change is needed, because that's not going to win. Just build a new model that makes everything else obsolete, and the world will find you. And that's basically what's happened at Olin. We did no marketing to bring these 900 universities here. Um, and when they come, by the way, in part of self-defense, we run a summer institute that has between 70 and 100 faculty every summer doing their own projects from their own university where they want to try something new. We scaffold that. We create a community of other people around the world that are doing similar things so they can learn from each other and then bring them back as alumni. And they build a, a whole community of innovation. Uh, that's how we're doing it. Not to follow what we do, but to learn how to do their own experiments, their own partner year. OK, now let's move to the important part. <laughs> OK, lessons learned. So, so what are we seeing as you watch this world go by from this really strange perch at Olin? Well, the first thing I would say is that we can see a very discernible trend. So there's a timeline here. And the first part of it is based on what I would call the assumption of the knowledge economy. Uh, in fact, the World Bank's, uh, for 20 years, their um, vision for improvement of mankind on the planet was to imagine building a knowledge-based economy in all the developing countries. Why is that? Because everybody knows the more you know, the better your life will be, right? That's why we send our kids to school. And if they're good at school, we keep sending them to school. Because the more you know, the better your life will be. So it's about knowledge. What does this look like? This looks like making sure you send kids to school and they're learning something. Well, how do you know they're going to learn something? Well, first off, you have to have somebody standing in front of you who has a PhD, who knows something, that's what the PhD means, talking to you, and so I'm putting stuff into your head. That's our model. We've been doing this for 500 years. Um, the efficient way to do this is to put people in rows. And some of them have pencils, and they're writing things down. So they're taking notes. Okay? This is the model we use. How do you know if it worked? It's about what you know. So we give standardized tests. Don't talk to your neighbor. That's cheating. Okay? It's all about multiple choice and so forth, because it's easy to grade that way. Um, there's a problem with this. It's called Google. <laughs> um, so for example, maybe you know this. Um, one of the favorite games that our family likes to watch, usually at dinner time, is Jeopardy. You know that game? We have a clicker, and there's three people, and they have these trivia questions. And if you know stuff and you're fast, you win money. Imagine that if this knowledge economy education model worked perfectly, everybody on the planet would be a Jeopardy champion. But when we're watching Jeopardy now, our younger daughter can Google the answer before the people on the stage can answer it. You can get answers. You can get knowledge to things which have almost no cost. It's like the air you breathe. It's, it's ubiquitous now. Um, knowledge of that kind is um, free, which has profound implications for your marketplace value and what companies are willing to pay for. They're not willing to pay for people who have an encyclopedic knowledge of things. It's like, how valuable is it that you've memorized the multiplication tables now? You know, that you have a calculator. Um, it may have some educational value, but it's certainly not a marketable skill. So what's the new event? It's what we call the maker economy. And you're beginning to see this show up all over the world. The maker economy has a different philosophy about what it means to be educated. Now it's not just what you put in to somebody's head. It's what comes out of it, too. In fact, it's learning to imitate somebody else so that you can produce something. I just came back from um, Hong Kong and Shenzhen in China. They call themselves the manufacturers of the world. Boy, are they good, they good at doing this. Okay? They started 30 years ago by taking things apart and re reverse engineering it. Now they're not reverse engineering it. They're creating things on their own. They're really good at it. Learning to make things is a, is a valuable um, commodity. And how do you teach this? Well, the teacher is no longer standing in front talking at you while you're writing notes. Now you're organized in small groups. And um, you're working on some kind of a project. It could be making a robot, but it could be 
writing uh, a term paper together, or it could be um, developing a play. Um, you know, life is a maker project. There aren't instructions, and you have to improvise in every step. Uh, this is a highly useful skill. It's a lot more intrinsically useful than remembering things, okay? Especially when it's available on Google. Um, what does it mean if you're successful? It's what you can do with what you know. It's not just what you know. By the way, did you know that Google is one of the most sought after employers on the planet? It's much easier to get into Harvard than it is to get a job at Google. Um, if you talk to their HR director, uh, which I did a couple of years ago, he said one in six employees at Google does not have a college degree. Think about that. His confidence that the piece of paper that you have from your fancy university with a GPA, that that represents what he needs in order to make money at Google is quite low. He thinks that he can find that out by interviewing people and seeing what they can do with what they know, um, much more valuable to them. So we need to rethink what the purpose of education is in order to align it and keep it in, in step with what's happening in corporations. This is not the end, okay? There's also the innovation economy, which is beginning to emerge. What is this about? <clears throat> this is not about what you put into kids' heads. It's about what comes out. Um, this is where the real money is, okay? We don't know how you teach it. We're still struggling with that. We've tried lots of things at Olin. Apparently, it doesn't matter whether the teacher has a PhD or not. Um, people are creative and are innovative, mostly, I think, because of peers that they're in. It's the culture that they're in. You can be creative in one environment and not creative in another. It depends on all of the signals around you. Uh, that's the trick. And we don't know how you, what the core issues are. Right now, are the, the ideas that are the most successful at Olin are what we call intrinsic motivation and design thinking. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Design thinking is core of that is at Stanford, you probably know. Um, it's really about what you conceive. Having a, a, a really important idea that changes the way people live, that other people resonate with, is really valuable. And if you, in fact, if you look at this, you can almost identify the companies that do each of these things. Um, the what you know companies for engineering graduates um, have a starting salary of about 60K a year. I tell you that, we are a placement officer. The companies that hire for what you conceive, double, 120K a year. Um, and you know that because these guys are not looking for encyclopedic knowledge with a long transcript. It, they're looking for what you actually create. And, they, and it's about interviewing and about what you've done. Uh, so this is a trend which we're seeing uh, not just at Olin, but almost at every place around the world. And, the, and frankly, this is not completely new. Every university produces some people in each of these all the time. Um, but the percentage of those is increasing. And you can tell the market demand because the salaries are so much higher for people in that area. And the salaries in this area, well, I'll save that for later. <laughs> OK. Um, this is also not new. This whole framing is not new. You know Yeats talked about this long ago. But filling a pail versus lighting a fire. And what's happening on the right is lighting a fire. This is not the only change. Another big change that's happening, um, human population. Has anybody seen this graph before? Uh, this is the population of the human species on the planet throughout all of human history. You know, starting over here with like two and a half million years ago. And you can see 7,000, 6,000, 5,000, blah, blah, blah. There's this little tiny blip about 1,200, 1,300, that's the Black Plague. Um, and then what happens here? It's a hockey stick. It's just going berserk. Human population is exploding. Um, what do you think is causing that? What happened about then? By the way, before about 1900, the human population was always lower than 1 billion. Now it's, it's you know 7 billion, on the way to 9 billion by 2050. And there's a lot of speculation about what will happen after that. Um, the most likely explanation is the technological revolution. Technology enabled people to, to manufacture food in very large quantities. When I was actually younger, I think and still in college, um, Earth Day 
was announced. You might remember that. There was a guy named Paul Ehrlich. Does anybody remember Paul Ehrlich? He had a book called The Population Bomb, how the whole world was going to die in famines. And he's a guy at Stanford. He was a really credible person. Didn't happen. Why? Mechanized agriculture um, created gazillions of calories of food at very low cost. Um, it's probably technology. But I don't care what the cause is. Look at that trend. This is, in fact, an existential threat. If you show population biologists this kind of graph, they'll tell you, we've seen this before. This is what happens to rabbits in the outback of, of Australia when the wolves are gone. By the way, in one generation, they breed themselves out of existence. Um, they're not paying attention to the amount of resources they have and what it takes to sustain life. You know, that could happen to humans, too, if we don't use the stuff between our ears. We need to think differently. We need to educate differently. This is a problem for the global human species. It's not an American problem. It's not an Indian problem or a European problem. Um, what does this mean for education? Well, in the National Academy of Engineering, they began worrying about this shortly after the year 2000. And they looked at what they call the grand challenges for the 21st century. What are the big issues that we as a species need to solve in order to preserve life on the planet? And these are the kinds of things, you know, make solar energy economical, manage the nitrogen cycle, advance health informatics, and so forth. They're not the only ones, by the way. This is a global problem. The UN Sustainable Development Goals, a mapping that's quite similar. They're not identical, but there's an awful lot of overlap. And they're concerned about the same sorts of issues. What's different about these problems? Well, these are complex, multidisciplinary uh, challenges that involve security, sustainability, health, and enhancing life. By the way, almost all teenagers know about this. You heard about the global climate change? You don't have to explain. Well, a chemical engineer is different from a civil engineer because, no, they don't need to talk about even what an engineer is. They know about these things, and they're worried about them. Um, the kinds of skills that it takes to solve these problems are really critical. You need to have um, the ability to think in a systems way, which means what? If you whack it over here, it pops up over there. There must be a connection okay? that's not obvious from the beginning. Understanding those connections and that you have to do with systems problems is really important. Um, the kinds of problems that you see are so coupled that the idea of having disciplinary boundaries that are deeply specialized is really called into question. Because now you have coupled problems that involve scientific, social, economic, political, even religious background. That unless you have that all in the early formulation, you have the wrong people in the room, you didn't formulate it correctly. We're seeing some of this already with social media and the problems that social media is generating with mental health in kids. We know how to make things happen really on a large scale almost instantly with very little cost in social media. October 2017, New York Times runs an article, it's an unprecedented epidemic of anxiety disorder among teenagers in America today. Has anybody heard of a teenager that has anxiety disorder? Yeah. Then when I talk to college presidents today, every single one of them will tell me their number one concern is the explosion of the demand for psychological counseling among undergraduates. It's, the budget has doubled every year for the last three years in a row. Um, what's causing it? Uh, we don't know. The next article in the New York Times a month later, um, there's a, an unprecedented spike in, in suicides among teenagers and a direct number of hours they spent on social media. Then what happens in January of last year, Tim Cook, CEO of Apple is on stage pleading with parents not to let their kids use an Apple iPhone with social media on it unsupervised. And then, of course, last April, um, we had this Mia Culpa tour with um, Zuckerberg in Congress. Well, we didn't know this would happen. Unintended consequences, okay? When we're playing with power tools of that magnitude, we have a responsibility to make sure we anticipate the consequences to all of humanity just to work online. It's a whole new kind of engineering that needs to be broadened. Um, by the way, as you think about creating the innovators you need to solve these problems, we're worried that the structure we have in higher education is part of the problem, not the solution. So let me explain this. Um, well, at the risk of 
offending some people, which has never stopped me in the past. Um, let me point out, this could be a map of the University of Michigan. Okay? I'm much more familiar with Ann Arbor than I am with Dearborn, so I'm not sure how the layout works here. But this blue thing up here is like the engineering school. The green thing is the business school. And this red thing, red circle, is kind of where arts, psychology, humanities. So think of it as where the library is. Um, if you have a kid who graduates from high school and they have to declare a major, and they enroll at the University of Michigan in engineering, they'll wind up spending four years in the engineering quad, right? Um, and they'll spend the time there because in order to get an ABET accredited engineering degree, 75%, three-fourths of the credit hours you take have to be in a course that's STEM related. That's ABET, okay? It's math, science, engineering, and technology. Um, so everybody that you see in the same building, every day they go to lunch together, they all have a PhD in science, math, or engineering. And to the exclusion of all the other kinds of learning, um, those wind up being very important to you. And after four years without you even noting it, you're developing a mindset that everything that is important in life has to do with feasibility. Because that's what really engineering talks about. And the kind of questions we ask are, can you do this thing based on what we know about natural law today? So if you used you know, somebody's equations, can you make a circuit that does x? Can you build a chemical that does y? It's all about what's possible relative to what we know about the natural law. But at the same time this is going on, the kids are up there in the engineering quad, on the other side of campus, over in the business school, they're studying business and economics. And in fact, to get an AACSB accredited degree, you have to spend half of your time uh, taking courses from people with a PhD in business. And they have to learn things like accounting and management, uh, organizational psychology, all of this stuff. The kinds of questions they ask are completely different. Questions like, um, how much money does it make? Does, does it have enough capital to launch? Is it sustainable over time? You know, what will be the financial and legal risks to this as you go forward? Their whole world is about that. Everything that they do is through, seen through the lens of viability. Is this financially viable? Um, and that's what they do, okay? To the exclusion of what you learn in these other subjects. Now, what about this other circle down here? You know, with the library, which, which by the way, those guys don't go there very often. I think it's two miles, if I remember correctly, on the campus. There's a bus, but you know, um, what do they study there? They have a different kind of question. They ask questions like, what is the meaning of beauty? What is the meaning of truth? What's the meaning of love? Okay. By the way, those questions aren't easy to analyze with vectors and equations. They don't apply very well with things like spreadsheets either. There are no dollar signs involved. Um, you think they're important questions? I mean, they determine all of human motivation. This is why people do what they do. Um, and on the other hand, People in this circle don't have an ABET or an AACSB or an outside organization that says you have to take so many credit hours of anything. They can make up whatever they want in their own discipline, by and large. I know that because I have a daughter who did it. Okay? One of the interesting things is she got a, a very good degree from a, a private university in the Boston area um, in this circle and in four years. She didn't take a single natural science course, and the only math course that she took was statistics, and we did that at the kitchen table in one semester. Um, so she didn't have to inter intersect with any of these other people. Okay, so, so why does that matter? Well, it matters for this reason. It turns out, if you look at innovation, innovation defined as the application of ideas in a way that will change the way people live. And a really profound idea, really profound innovation, is an innovation that changes the way people live so profoundly that you can't remember what the world was like before. Okay? Um, my kids can't imagine what the world was like before the caveman had an iPhone. Okay? We now have the heads down society. You don't know how to look at people in the eye. Um, it's, it's addictive. Um, that's what we think of as innovation. Now, 
defy you to identify one innovation um, that's changed the world and the way people live that isn't simultaneously feasible because nothing happens that we know about that isn't consistent with natural law and also viable. It generates more revenue than it costs to make it and much more importantly is also desirable. Every innovation that you can think of has to have all three. But you see the way we're educating people is we're pulling this apart and we're eliminating the interactions between the two and we're allowing them to leave with a mindset that says the only thing that's important is this thing that I studied. Because all the smart people I know, that's what they do. Um, it's this intersection that we're missing. And it's this intersection that I think that is really critical. Now I happen to have, so I grew up in the blue circle and we have our own narrative in engineering about how the world works, okay? When I was a young faculty member, actually at the University of California before going to USC, they said, here's what you should do in February. You need to go to Washington and you need to talk to your senator. And you need to tell them, look, you need to support that bill for the increase in funding for NSF. Because the National Science Foundation will send money for just in case science to my university. I'll be able to take some of that and publish something, which one of those ideas, surely some of them are gonna be good for something. The university will take those ideas, they'll throw them over the fence to the tech transfer office. They'll have a couple of, of lawyers there and maybe a venture capitalist and they'll start a tech park on the side of the university. This is going to change the world. Um, a few of those companies will make money and if they make money, they'll generate jobs and new tax dollars that will go back to Washington so you can increase the NSF budget. That's it. All of innovation is engineering and technology. There's a problem with this, okay? I happen to be serving on the board of trustees across the street at Babson College. Now Babson is a business school, it's all about entrepreneurship. And I did that for 18 years. Every member of the board except me had an MBA. I'm being punished by some former sins, I guess. <laughs> um, one of the things that happened is they constantly use the word innovation all the time. But don't they see innovation is all about science and engineering? How dare they talk about that? And then one day, one of them pointed out, hey, do you think that the credit card may have changed the way people live? Just the credit card. How many people carry cash anymore? Have you been to China? They don't even have cash. I mean, it's all about your phone. Um, can't remember what the world was like when they had cash. You know, as far as I can tell, the credit card didn't involve any Nobel Prize in physics. Um, maybe there's another path to innovation beyond just the idea of some widget that we designed in Silicon Valley in our garage and, and created a company around it. So maybe you have to broaden your thinking about it. And then I happen to have a brother who's an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. He's on his fourth company. He was just out there last week. Um, and I showed him this and he said, you know, that's the secret to really successful innovation. Um, he says, if I'm going to start a company, I would much rather start with an idea that a lot of people really want and start there. Don't start with a widget that you designed in the garage and you're now trying to figure out that you could do something with it. Because you can't even explain to people what it does, first of all. Why would they care or invest in it? But if this thing actually cures cancer, or does something really profound, your phone will be ringing off the hook. Have you got that done yet? You know, do you need some more money? Uh, let's get this started. So he said, think about Facebook. Has anybody heard of Facebook? Um, how about Google? How about, you know, Twitter. These companies didn't exist 20 years ago. They're big on the stock exchange today. What does Facebook make? Can you hold it in your hand? Is it, a, is it something that you can touch and transfer? Maslow, I think, is the answer. What Facebook was designed to do was to allow people to tell their personal story to somebody else that they care about. Now, there's been a lot of uh, pollution in the uh, business model that's gotten involved, but why is it that your kids are so revealing? In the, why do they text pictures that they shouldn't be texting to each other? What's the driving force? Maslow, the psychologist, my paraphrase, the most important thing in every person's life is to be the most important person in another person's life. And the way we have developed our society, you, you can't 
that now. It's very hard to do that. Um, you grew up in the Midwest, and you got a job in San Francisco, and you left home when you're 23. You're far away from your family. Your high school um, sweetheart is now living in New York. Um, you can't talk about it at work. Loneliness is one of the biggest concerns about human health today. Um, so Facebook actually has an appeal. The driving force is psychological. It's about being the most important person in somebody else's life. And you don't do that by just talking about business. You have to talk about what you care about. If you don't understand that, you're not going to have a viable business in the big areas. And it's not coming out of the differential equations in the engineering school. So it's this interaction here that's really important. Bottom line. No amount of specialization in narrow courses is going to produce the innovators that we need to deal with the global population explosion, which, by the way, is the driving force behind all of the uh, grand challenges, both in the NAE and also in the UN. Um, so what did we learn about it at Olin? Well, we learned really there's three reasons why we're not producing the engineers that we need. Number one. We're teaching the wrong people. Number two, we're teaching them the wrong stuff. And number three, we're using teaching methods which are known to be largely ineffective. Otherwise, though, we're doing a great job. <laughs> what do you mean the wrong people? I'm here today because my math teacher in high school said I was pretty good at math, so probably I should be an engineer. Neither of us knew what that is. Okay. Um, she had never met one, and I hadn't either. In fact, I met my first engineer on the day I was a freshman at the University of California. It was also the first person I ever met with a PhD. Um, engineering is not about math. It involves math. That's not the key. It, what is an engineer? In our view, and this is an engineer with a lowercase e that I think could work in any discipline, an engineer is a person who envisions what has never been and does whatever it takes to make it happen. And that might involve math, OK? But it might not. Um, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's a motivation in life. If, if you're studying math and science and engineering and that's not what you want to do, there's probably room for you as an applied scientist, not an engineer. Um, this book by Tony Wagner, I think, at Harvard, does a pretty good job of helping you understand what the role of creativity and innovation is in education and how it produces people. The key there is improvisation, um, improvise. That's how jazz music works. That's how everything that involves creativity works. Um, we also learned a bit about the new culture of learning. So one of my favorite books is by this guy, John Seeley Brown. Does anybody know who John Seeley Brown is? Yeah, a few people. He was chief scientist at Xerox. He was the guy who, who built Xerox Park, uh, Palo Alto Research Center. This is where all PC computing came from. Um, and when he finished there, he became very concerned about the way people learn and how the internet is going to affect that. And this book really provides uh, a, an interesting contrast in understanding the new culture of learning that's developing. So as you can see, the traditional way, we basically tell you you don't have the prerequisites for that course. You're not allowed to take it yet. Um, you have to follow orders. That's why you're supposed to be here. Um, don't color outside the lines. That's not going to count. Um, on the other hand, learn in class. That's why we take roll. You have to be there at 8 o'clock. Uh, I bet that doesn't work here either, right? And kids <laughs> bring their laptop. And they, this is way more interesting to watch YouTube than it is to see what you're saying in class. Unless you can compete with those ideas in a more engaging way, they're not going to come. Um, learn alone. Don't talk to your neighbor. That's cheating, okay? as opposed to learning in team. This is the new culture of learning. The old method is problem-based. Why? Lecture-based is the least engaging. I bet you 50% of you right now are having trouble keeping your eyes open. I can see. Or else you're thinking about you know, what's on your phone or what you're going to do after this class. And why did I come to this thing anyway? Um, the, aside from a lecture, having people involved in a project where you actually have to talk to each other, you have to express yourself. If it comes from inside out, you will remember it. It's much more engaging. Okay? That's why projects are more successful than lectures. But there's a better design-based learning. So what's that about? Aren't they the same? Almost, but they're different in a really important way. 
So project-based learning is what happens when an instructor plans out, before you get to class, a project. It's a kit. Think of it as a model airplane kit or an art kit. We have all the pieces you need, and you have to figure out how to put them together, and you have the experience of building it. Okay? Think of it as paint by numbers. You remember paint by numbers when you were a kid? It's sort of like a coloring book. It has a number in there, and you paint this one red and that one blue. Design-based learning is learning to paint from a blank sheet of paper. Okay? There are no guidelines. You have to decide what to paint first. It exercises a different part of your brain. Okay? You have to take responsibility for the whole idea that you're going to paint first. If you do that 25 to 35 times before they graduate, it changes who they are. I can tell you, we've watched that. Um, all of this, though, is in John C. Brown's book. So that's the new culture of learning. But it's actually not new. This is the same kind of pedagogy that I had in graduate school, and I bet you you did too. Um, you didn't learn in class. You learned 24-7. You had to come to your instructor with the idea that you wanted to do, you were passionate about. You talked to the other graduate students constantly, trying to figure out, do you have any idea how to solve this problem? Um, it's not new. OK, so but what difference does that make, Rick? Because if it's a graduate school, it's not going to work for undergraduates. Have you ever heard of Montessori? Okay. It actually works in K-12, and it works in graduate school. It will work in the middle, too. If we, adopt, if we abandon our dogmatic commitment to courses with structures, with lectures, and with multiple choice tests, and think differently about what it means to be educated. Okay. Um, my favorite quote from his book, um, for most of the 20th century, our educational system has been built on the assumption that teaching is necessary for learning to occur. You can't learn unless you have the teacher. Um, you should rethink that. We're probably the most expendable part of the learning culture. The teachers are maybe the resource, like the librarian. They're not necessary for learning. Okay? And we need to understand how that works and develop a system that makes use of it. Um, now, let me move on to what I think is the new frontier, which we're all just trying to learn. Uh, it turns out that knowledge is not enough, okay? That um, innovators require much more than specialized knowledge, okay? More often than not, your attitude determines your altitude in life, not your aptitude. This guy doesn't even have legs, and he's gonna climb much higher on that granite wall than I will. Have you seen this film, this movie out lately? It's a, it's a National Geographic documentary. I think it's called Solo. It's free solo, yeah. Absolutely stunning. This guy's climbing uh, El Capitan, I think it's El Capitan, in uh, Yosemite with no ropes and no safety nets at all, like 3,000 feet straight up. Um, but he has legs, okay? Um, Attitudes, behaviors, and motivations. This is really much more important than content knowledge now. Um, content knowledge has a very short shelf, shelf life, and it, you'll have to replace it quickly. Attitudes, behaviors, and motivations, though, shape identity, agency, and purpose, who you are. And if you can get this right, the content knowledge will take care of itself over time. What is this? If we talk to a bunch of employers, as we have over the last two decades, you hear this constantly. We're looking for people who have an entrepreneurial mindset. We're looking for employees that have ethical behavior. We don't have to teach that. We're looking for employees that are good at teamwork and they're natural leaders. You know, we're looking for employees that have interdisciplinary thinking and a global perspective and blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on. So where are we hearing this? Okay, well, here's some of them. The National Academy of Engineering study. There's also a Council on Competitiveness study, um, which is the National Engineering Forum. Um, STEM Connector. Has anybody heard of STEM Connector? This is a relatively new group, 6,000 companies. Okay? They have a task force on the characteristics of the workforce of the future that they need. Really interesting. The most important characteristic is what they call employability skills. What does that mean? This is not rocket science, folks. This means if you say you'll be there at 8 o'clock, you're there at 8 o'clock. Okay? You come ready to work. Uh, you don't have this attitude that everybody's there to serve you. You're there to make value for the company. Um, it's a whole new set of mindset skills that 
we've been not paying much attention to that are really important. And of course, innovation excellence. And of course, finally, the IBM T-shaped person. Um, has anybody heard of the T-shaped person from IBM? This has been out there for about 30 years now. Um, they're basically saying the vertical stem on the T is the depth of knowledge in some content, like electrical engineering. The horizontal bar on the T is your ability to work across disciplines and talk to people who are very different from you. And they've talked about teamwork and collaboration and the ability to work interdisciplinary for 30 years at IBM. That's not the way we educate, though. Can you see the mismatch? Um, this is all about mindset. And our summary of what that is are five mindsets that you can teach. Um, collaborative mindset. These are people who would just not ever want to eat alone. Okay? They're just curious. They'd like to eat with somebody new. They'd like to find out where did you come from? What is your work about today? Constantly engaging with people in a different field. This is hard to do at a big state university because you, know, you, you live in the same building. So my question is, who do you have lunch with every day? Do your uh, business faculty members have lunch with the arts and humanities faculty members? Do they have lunch? I mean, where are they? Um, this is really a critical. It's a mindset. And of course, there's entrepreneurial mindset. So what is entrepreneurial mindset? Um, I guess you know, I'll take, take a second to talk about this. The, um, the most vivid and I think accurate picture of entrepreneurial mindset that I've run into recently is a quote from Peretz who was, until very recently, the president of the Technion in Israel. This is from uh, a Wall Street Journal article about the new um, Cornell Tech campus on Roosevelt Island in New York. Have you heard of this? Cornell is building this new campus. So Cornell has chosen the Technion from Israel as his partner. Um, so the Wall Street Journal guy decided, I'm going to go find out why. He interviews Peretz Levy. Why did they pick you? And he says, well, the reason is the Technion is an absolute singularity in its success at producing startup companies, startup businesses out of technical research. On a pound for pound basis, the Technion outperforms almost any other university you can find. Now the guy from the Wall Street Journal is even more confused. <laughs> he says, this doesn't make any sense. How in the world, I mean, I can see Silicon Valley, it's a rich area. But why the Technion in Israel? Don't you guys realize the people all around you don't like you? I mean, they're, they have guns pointed at you. How could you possibly be inventive here? So Perret says, well, you have it exactly backwards. He says, here's the deal. You can't live in Israel unless you're an optimist, or you would be insane. Okay? You have to innately, deep in your bones, believe that there could always be a better world. It's not hopeless. On the other hand, because you live in Israel, you know it's up to you to make it a better world. Don't count on other people to do it. So you take the initiative without the resources to create that better world that you envision in your heart. That's the essence of an entrepreneurial mindset. It's a positive way of looking at the world. It could always be better, and it's up to me to make it happen. Those are the employees that corporations are talking to us about. Okay, And obviously, a global mindset and ethical mindset. It's not just about knowledge content anymore. And I think that's what we as the, in the academy have to realize. When we walk into a classroom, it's about shaping a mindset. It's not just about transferring content knowledge. So when I first started running into this, I began to think mindset, mindset, what is this? This sounds like one of those latest fads, you know, self-help books. You can find them in the airport. And you read this, and your life will be better by the time you land and wherever you're going. Um, and then I ran into Carol Dweck. Has anybody heard of Carol Dweck at Stanford? Carol's amazing. Okay, For 25 years, she's been doing research on the way kids learn. And what she's discovered is that you can, char you can characterize kids into two buckets, depending on what they believe about themselves. And the lens that she's using is your intelligence, which is a surrogate for do you believe you're capable of learning? Okay? If you believe that your intelligence is part of your DNA, it's like your eye color. It's something you inherited from your parents. And you know, it is what it is, and you can't change it. Then you have what she calls a fixed mindset. On the other hand, if you believe that your intelligence is like a muscle, it's something you can grow. 
Uh, if, you take, if you have challenge and you have the opportunity to work on harder and harder problems, you can get better and better at it, and there's no limit to what you can learn. That's a growth mindset. These are beliefs about yourself. Okay? And then she's learned how to cue these beliefs in the classroom by having teachers bring certain uh, attitudes and behaviors of their own. By the way, I believe you can only teach what you know. If you don't have a growth mindset, you're going to have a really hard time transmitting it to the next generation. Okay? It's a big issue. So Carol has been watching this, and that the people who have growth mindset and that you feed it in K-12 with the right sort of scaffolding in the classroom produces sustainable, measurable improvement in learning. Okay? This is her, for this, that's her book, by the way, which I highly recommend. This one is, is quite good. And for that, she got um, the Yidong Prize, which is a $3.9 million prize from China for ideas in education that change the world. Think of it as four times the Nobel Prize. Um, she's also won the, and that's what this thing is for, the Atkinson Prize of the National Academy of Science uh, a couple of years ago. You might have heard of Angela Duckworth. Uh, Angela's at Penn. She's working with grit or power of passion and perseverance, how that changes lives. Um, and her book is quite interesting. And that's the Yidong Prize for Carol. Well, it turns out that if you look at Carol's work on fixed and growth mindsets, it's now being applied in the university. One of her former PhD students, Mary Murphy, who's a professor of psychology at Indiana University, just published a paper a couple months ago on 15,000 students in a major university and 150 different faculty members parsing the faculty into two groups, the faculty members who have fixed mindset versus the faculty members who have a growth mindset. Did nothing else. Look what happens to the students in those classes. Turns out that the students who had a teacher with a growth mindset that's this group over here, had higher um, test scores, had higher academic achievement in the same courses than those students who happened to get a faculty member with a fixed mindset. And in fact, for underrepresented minorities, this is even more important, okay? The gap between white and Asian kids and underrepresented minorities in a, in a teacher with a fixed mindset is cut in half when you have a teacher with a growth mindset. So there's something to this. There's some real signal in here. It's not just um, you know, a feel-good book. If you look at the, the real um, um, deepest research in this area, I think it's by James Heckman, who won the Nobel Prize in 2000 uh, at Chicago. And he looked at that question I brought up earlier, remember? The more you know, the better your life will be. Turns out, that's a testable hypothesis. You can do that. So you went to the IRS, and you got all this data for millions of people. What's their educational achievement? You know, what's their lifestyle later? Turns out, not so much. Okay? Having a PhD in sociology does not lead to you being the wealthiest or the happiest person in life. Um, the correlation is not very high. But other things came out that were really interesting. What he found out is a better predictor for success in life than intelligence or academic achievement is what he calls grit, okay? Per perseverance and passion. I'm not gonna give up. I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. That's what really correlates best. So the, that's actually what got um, Angela Duckworth uh, on the whole issue of grit. Can you teach grit? What, where does it come from? And Olin's best bet at this point in time, grit comes from intrinsic motivation. You don't give up on the things you care about. So if you're teaching, look for the things that people care about and build your entire course around that. So I'll tell you about this one course we have where uh, we have students in, in small groups, we, in groups of five, on the first day of class, we ask them, identify a group of people whose lives you want to change. Not someday, but in, five, in four months, OK? Now, now we're going to scaffold this so you can go meet 10 of them in the first two weeks and interview them for two hours, ask them about their life. Come back from that with two or three ideas about what you could do that would really change the way they live. I don't care whether it involves math or science. It's people, OK? And then once you know that you have something you could do, and I'll give you a real quick example. One of our kids had a um, 
grandmother who, who came uh, down with Alzheimer's. She was in assisted living. They interviewed 10 Alzheimer's patients in assisted living uh, near our campus. In two weeks, they did 20 hours of structured interviews. They came back with answers to the question, what does it mean to be elderly in America today? Um, what is their lifestyle like? What keeps them up at night? You know what they found? It won't surprise you. Everyone had a friend that had fallen and broken a hip um, sometime in the last couple of years. And sometimes it didn't heal, and they're now confined to a wheelchair. And these folks were terrified of that outcome. And they learned that the reason is because when you're in the wheelchair, you can't look people in the eye anymore. You only look at their belt buckle. It's, uh, it's dehumanizing. They come and visit you in a group. They, ga they gather above your head, and they talk about you in the third person. Um, it's, you know, changes their life. In fact, not only that, but they can't walk anymore, so they can't control their metabolism, so they have trouble managing their weight. They can't even determine their weight because it's a big ordeal to have somebody hold you up on the scale because you can't stand. So they just don't even want to care. They just want to give up, okay? What are you going to do about that? So the kids looked at each other and said, look, we're, we're 18. I don't think we're going to fix the aging thing today. Um, maybe we can do something about the weight. All right, so what does that mean? So, so they said, well, maybe we could, for example, maybe we could imagine a, a little carpet that has pressure sensors on it underneath, and you could drive your wheelchair right onto this carpet, and there would be an RFID, RFID radio transmitter that transmits the data to your iPhone, and there's a, a, an app on your iPhone that interprets it and says, Domenico, you weigh 150 pounds today, okay? Be cool, right? I wish I weighed 150 pounds. Um, wouldn't that be cool? And they went back to these, these uh, patients and they asked them, would this matter to you? Would you think this would be cool? So what happened? Um, the, the patients said, you could really do that? Man, if you could do that, that would change my life. That would be amazing if you could do that. We said, well, we're not really sure we could do that, but we think we can. So they came back to campus, and they were on fire. Who on this campus knows anything about pressure transducers now? Who knows anything about um, radio transmission of data? I don't care. I haven't had a class in it. I want to talk to that person. In four months, these 18-year-olds built a prototype. Okay? Now they had one. The next course in the curriculum, how to start and run a business. Now they have a client group. They have a prototype. They know exactly what they want to build. They don't know what it costs to manufacture it. Are there any sort of you know, product liability issues, what about marketing and managing? They put together a business plan. They competed across the street at Babson. They won the competition. They came home with $10,000. They started a business in their dorm room. They're selling these little carpets. They're called lily pad scales, OK? You can still buy them. They're on the internet today. Two of the kids turned down graduate school and working for a company for two years to ride this out to see what happens when you start a new company. That's the power of intrinsic motivation. If you work with people, this is the, the human-centered engineering, if you start by interviewing people and asking them about their lives, two things happen you can't get from a flat screen anywhere. Number one, empathy. You build empathy when you hear what the world feels like to somebody else firsthand. And you make eye contact with them, and you have an interaction with them. And the second thing is when you solve a problem and you come back with something that would really change their lives, you build a sense of purpose. Even though I'm only 18, I don't have a PhD from MIT, I changed this person's life. I did something that could make a difference. And you should bet that will change their determination and their passion and perseverance to continue to do other things in the rest of their life. They don't drop out. They don't quit. They'll continue. That's what we think is the best route to grit. Um, I have to put this up here. This is my undergraduate mentor, Mel Ramey. He's the first engineer I ever met and the first person with a PhD. The interesting thing about Mel is I had learned so many things from him. He passed away about a year and a half ago. Um, he's been a mentor for 40 years. Um, turns out I learned from him, hopeful faculty members spread hope among their students. And cynical faculty members spread cynicism. You never met a cynical faculty member, have you? Okay. Every faculty. I've been involved with in four different universities. That's the dominant culture, right? You impress everybody else by being, nah, can't possibly be good enough. Um, this person doesn't deserve tenure. They didn't do as much as I did. Um, it's all about cynicism. It's a culture. By the way, if you spread that cynicism to your students, you're not doing them any favor. 
Look at those mindsets that the companies are looking for. It's not cynicism. By the way, startup company, startup campus is allergic to cynicism. You, you have to be almost naively optimistic that you can make things happen when you have no resources and all these headwinds in front of you. Uh, cynicism does not work, okay? So I also learned from him that every time you walk into a classroom and you pick up a piece of chalk, you're not just teaching calculus. You're spreading a mindset. You're shaping a mindset. You may not be paying attention to that. You may not be deliberately wanting to do that. You can't avoid it. You're doing it every time you walk in. So I think it's time we took responsibility for the mindsets that we are transmitting. We talk about this. We do research in this. We cultivate it in our graduates because more for their long-term career than teaching them how to integrate by parts in calculus. By the way, I didn't know until very late, Mel Ramey wasn't just a structural engineer at the University of California. He was a coach. I mean, a real coach. He coached Olympic jumpers. Um, in fact, two of his former mentees have gold medals in the Olympics for long jump. Then I began to connect the dots. What does a coach do that a teacher doesn't do? He builds a growth mindset, okay? Yeah, you grew up on the south side of Chicago. You didn't have a father who was in the NFL. I think you can win a gold medal in the Olympics, okay? But you have to believe in yourself, and you have to stretch yourself, and you have to never give up. And I'm gonna be your toughest enemy in your corner telling you, in fact, when he, when he did this, he wanted to know what your schedule was. When did you go to bed on Saturday night? What'd you have for breakfast on Sunday? Um, this is like really intrusive. That's because he was building confidence and discipline in yourself. Um, that, I think, is the direction we need to go um, with education. So I'll skip over this. This is the Gallup data, which uh, Gallup did this largest survey in history of what really matters in higher education. 100,000 alumni from hundreds of universities. Two questions jump off the page. Did somebody care about you as a person, as an undergraduate? And the second question was, did you have an opportunity to apply what you learned in a real world context while you were still a student? It's not just about books, it's about people. If you answered yes to both of those questions, doubled your positive life outcome, according to Gallup. By the way, people with a high, um, um, what they call, well-being index are employees that employers are, are clamoring for because they make a very low use of the uh, um, health insurance. They have a low absentee rate. They're the first people in line who want to be uh, promoted. Um, it's, it's got a, a lot of legs to it. But the heartbreaking thing, only 3% of population in America says that yes to both of those questions. And the, the data will surprise you if you look at which universities do it. Um, the universities that do the worst at producing this, that they have, the alumni have the lowest rate, rate to this, Ivy Leagues. The universities that do the best, historically black institutions. Because they know uh, if you don't get to this point where you're changing your mindset and you're dealing with the growth mindset, there's no hope. Uh, and so they build the whole institution to support people who do that. Um, this is, you know, hang on, I'm almost done. All right? Um, there's a big narrative out right now, particularly in public institutions, that the only reason we have higher education is to prepare you for a job. And if you're not producing people with a good job at the end, then we should cut off all the funding for your institution completely. I think it's completely wrong. I'll bet you most of you feel the same way. Our job is not just to produce knowledge and skills. It's also to add mindset. And if you do that, they will have jobs when they come out the other end. We must set the bar higher, not lower. And it's not a competition between either being educated or get a job. It's both. They, every student has a reasonable expectation of being employable when they come out the end. We need to make sure that happens. If you look at the way we structure higher ed, the two ubiquitous in every continent, we think that higher education is about academic disciplines and it's about um, research. Okay. The, the PhD is for the person who does the research in that area. The bachelor's degree is the person that has like the baby research in that area, and that's what we do. Um, this is not going to get it. So my, my feeling is that the whole idea of academic disciplines is obsolete. It needs to be replaced. 
And the whole idea that the most, uh, the highest form of human intelligence that's ever existed is a person with a PhD who finds things out and wins the Nobel Prize, I mean, that's nice. It's not the only or the most important thing now for human uh, contributions. So what do you face it with? Well, finding things out is still cool. I'm not saying don't do it. It's not, though, the most valuable thing. Making sense of the world now is a much more difficult thing than it's ever been before. And finally, envisioning what has never been and doing whatever it takes to make it happen is how we're going to change the world to deal with that population explosion that's going um, in spite of us. So what, what does making sense of the world, what does that mean to you? A little story. Um, I think this is how we have Donald Trump. I think this is why there's fake news. I think there's why there's a lot of confusion about what truth is. You know, it's a really important course at the University of Washington in Seattle now. Uh, it's a new core course for what does it mean to be an educated person. It's called calling bullshit, okay? It's how to, how to navigate through this polluted water of just information. What's really true? And what do you do about it when it's not true? Um, very important course. So I would recommend taking a look at that. So making sense of the world in research. When I was in about the fifth grade in a farm community, I decided to do a research project on penguins. I mean, I lived on a chicken farm, and the whole idea of a bird that could swim just didn't make any sense. So how did you do this? I went to the school uh, library, and I waited my turn to check out the P volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica. You remember that? I took it home at night. I copied down the whole page on penguins, and I drew a little freehand drawing of a penguin in the corner. And I turned it in. I'm expecting I'm going to get a good grade because I know how to find things out. That's what research is about. Most important thing in life. So I have a grandson now, and he's seven. When he does this project, it'll work out differently. He'll borrow his mom's iPad, and he'll Google the word penguins. Now, I did this a couple weeks ago. Do you know what happens? 55 million articles instantly come up. His problem is actually not finding things out. His problem is making sense of it. Um, how do you make sense of this? What does it mean to make sense of this? And I think there's a pattern to it, and we need to teach it. It means surveying the mountain peaks of the things that are really important, weaving them into a narrative that makes sense, it's coherent in your life, um, so that you can relate to it as something that makes sense to you for the rest of your life. That's a skill that's really important. We're, that's why what teachers do, right? But that's not what we pay people the most for. We pay the people the most for getting the NSF grant that won the biggest prize in research. We've got to fix this. If we don't figure out how to, how to really improve finding, I mean, making sense out of the world, we're going to lose more than just um, the next generation. Academic disciplines. I think we should just do away with them. Um, I would like to do an experiment at Olin where we brought in, say, 25 new kids every year who were not engineers. And they took a core program which had the same sort of basic science, math, and English, and history that the other kids do. Don't do any technology projects. They'll do projects on things like what's the cause of poverty? What's the cause of um, you know, um, depression in teenage kids? And let them complete their degree without designation, just a bachelor's degree. And I'll bet you, five years after they graduate, you will not be able to see a difference in their employment pattern, in their income, in their life well-being than the ones who had an engineering degree. Uh, I don't think the label matters. We're seeing kids at Olin graduate with mechanical engineering degrees who are bought instantly by Google to go write software. Olin does not have computer science. Okay? And 20% of our graduates went to Google and Microsoft for several years. Why are they doing that? Um, they're being bought. That's basically what's happening. But the discipline background does not matter, really. Um, but what does matter is this, four things. This is what's happening with 25, 35 courses that they're taking, the projects. They're learning things that matter. Learning things that matter to somebody that you care about, like those um, elderly people who are worried about uh, living in a wheelchair. Learning things in context. Learning things in context means that you don't take them out of context to fit the theory of economics. You have to have multiple disciplines in the room at the same time. So we've got to figure that one out. But you have to have a sociologist and a, and a microbiologist and an engineer in the same room, or you can't diagnose the problem right. Thirdly, you have to learn things in teams. 
Forget this business of don't talk to your neighbor that's cheating. No company told us that that was what they were worried about. What they told us they were worried about is being able to work as a team and to build expertise in a group. And finally, making things that change other people's lives. That's what's really important. Um, we have this coalition for life transforming education that I'll tell you about. University of Michigan at Dearborn is part of it, um, but I'll save that for Q&A. Um, my last quote is from Chuck Vest, uh, former president of MIT and the National Academy of Engineering. And when he was asked about education, this is basically what he said. Making universities and engineering schools exciting, creative, adventurous, rigorous, demanding, and empowering milieus is much more important than the curricular details. Don't copy our course syllabus. Develop that culture, and you'll get it right. If you're still awake, I'll let you go. You're absolutely right. In fact, he's almost the only president from MIT that didn't come from MIT. Uh, and he, look at what an impact he made. It's amazing. Could I point out he was the dean of engineering at Ann Arbor Day? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Still awake? Yes. Still awake? Yes. So if you're Proposing doing away with disciplines, what does the structure look like at the university then? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure. Obviously, this is an embryonic idea. Uh, does not mean that you don't have people who have specialized learning as part of your faculty. I mean, there's a couple of quick reactions to this. Have you heard of Oxford and Cambridge? Um, their first two years don't have disciplines or courses. You have a tutorial with an, in, with an instructor. Um, it's in the most rigorous and the most authentic way of assessment I've ever found is an oral exam. You remember your PhD exam? It's like burned into your head with a hot iron. Um, you, you, there's no place to hide. That's the way they do that for two years. And the original plan for Oxford and Cambridge is the residential colleges with people with different disciplines that live there with the students. Um, that's one model. We actually looked at that quite a bit at the beginning. I just last year happened to have the, um, the responsibility of leading the NEASC accreditation team for Hampshire College in Western Mass. Does anybody know what Hampshire? Hampshire was one of the five schools, you know, it's what, Mount Holyoke, um, um, UMass Amherst, Amherst College in you know, Hampshire and so on, in Smith. That's, yeah, I can't, can't forget Smith. Um, so it was the experimental college that does not have majors. The students didn't graduate with majors. It's an absolutely marvelous learning model. They do miniature theses. So at Hampshire, there's a core program in the first year. The second year, you begin to define the question that you want to look at. You put together a multidisciplinary team, usually two faculty members from some other field, and you write a thesis in your senior year on that question. And their library is filled with the bound theses of all the students that have ever graduated from Hampshire. They produce people like Ken Burns, you know who he is? Um, Amazing. When we interviewed those kids, they were the most articulate, um, self-confident. They knew what they knew, and they knew what they didn't know, and they were very good at it. And it doesn't seem to have mattered to their employer that you couldn't say a bachelor's in what? Chemistry? Uh, was it English? Didn't matter. It was defined by what they learned. I don't know what the structure is. Um, I don't think it matters. I do think what matters is the community and the culture uh, within the academic uh, uh, institution that enables the students to freely learn from everyone else. One of the problems with the academic disciplines we have now is it prevents that. You only learn the specialized stuff from the small group of people in the same building that go there every day. Other questions? Yes? So you were commenting on feasibility, viability, and desirability of yes. innovation. So if you take those and you apply them to the product that you're innovating, which is college education, right? Which of those do you see as being that's a really good question. No one's ever asked that question before. So, uh, you know, there are, and it depends on the college. Uh, some of the things that were feasible for Olin to do would not be feasible for the University of Michigan to do, okay? 
some of the things that are feasible for Michigan to do would not be feasible for Olin. So you have to look at the boundary conditions that are real. You do have to live within the real world. Um, the viable thing is becoming a big issue these days, um, how much you generate revenue. I don't know if you folks have been following. It's really easy to see in the Northeast. Something like six or eight um, liberal arts colleges have gone bankrupt since January. It, it, there, this is a phenomenon. You might know Clay Christensen and his uh, co-op, Michael Hurd, and they are predicting that half of all liberal arts colleges will be bankrupt in 10 years. Um, there's a problem with, there's, there's four problems, okay, uh, that the public has with what we do. One of them is tenure. They don't understand why we have it. If it's such a great idea, why doesn't Ford have it or Google? Um, secondly, um, they're concerned about the monotonic uh, preference for research over teaching. Um, why is that good for my kid? Um, they're also worried about, and this is where the viability comes from, the spiraling sticker price in higher ed. Why does it not correlate with anything? It just goes up. Um, it's ridiculous. I mean, the, the starting sticker price now is like 70K per year um, in most, at least private schools around the country. Four years, that's over a quarter of a million dollars. Most people don't have a house that's worth that much. Um, so they don't even bother to apply. I mean, it's hopeless, right? Um, and then the last one, which we've seen explode since the election in 2016, and that's the perception of political bias in higher ed. And I could talk about that for a long time. Um, so those are all challenges as well. Desirability thing is also an issue. Um, I, it's not clear, it's not clear that um, everybody wants to go to college. And it's also not clear that what they think they're getting is producing the result that they thought when they went in. Um, we, we have a lot of noise in the system that needs to be fixed. I'm personally, I've, I've been head for the last three years of the National Academy of Science Board on Higher Education and Workforce. And I've been suggesting that we do a deliberate research study on each of those four questions and it, th this means a, a panel of uh, you know, 15 university presidents with a group of, um, of commissioned researchers to do an evidence-based report with 10 recommendations on what we should do to improve the situation. If tenure is really the right answer, then let's prove it and let's all say the same thing when CNN comes with a microphone and puts it in your mouth. Why do you have tenure at this university? Well, here's why, okay? It's beneficial for your kids for these reasons. And if it's not, then let's start talking about fixing it. By the way, nobody has run up to say, I'll fund that. I'd like to do that tomorrow. <laughs> um, and the other university presidents are saying, go back to Owen. You know, we don't want to hear that. They'll get us in big trouble at home. Okay, other questions? Yes? Hi, um, you've shared with us how your community and your culture Yeah, yeah, really important question. So Olin doesn't have very many alumni because we're small. I don't think I ever told you exactly, but we have 350 students, period, whole thing. Um, we're small for a reason because we want to be able to reinvent the school on, on short notice if something goes really wrong, which has happened more than once. So at this point in time, we have about 1,000 alumni. Um, if one of the metrics in terms of how this has affected the alumni is the percentage of the alumni who bother to write a check back to the school every year. Um, and every year since, our, uh, since we've started, except for one, we have had over 70% of the alumni write a check each year. Now to put that in context, when I was dean at the University of Iowa, which I think is a really good public university, our alumni giving rate was 7%, okay? So having 70% with another zero there is a big deal. Uh, now these are young, okay? So I mean our oldest alum is 36. So um, we're not getting the $100 million gifts yet, um, but we think that this has really uh, made an impact. The other thing was because the school is so small, my wife and I have been able to invite for years every student to our house for dinner in small groups. So like 30 dinners a year, we cover the whole thing. Um, by the time they graduate, um, they're like our kids, which means that we start getting invited to go to weddings, all right? <laughs> it's, it's like too many weddings. Um, and now they're starting to have kids of their own. Turns out that they're, this is 
dangerous. When you put that many people, by the way, if to go to school at Olin, you have to live there on campus for all four years. Um, this enables the 25 or 35 projects. If, we, if they lived anywhere, they couldn't, the logistics of getting back on together at night wouldn't work. But here they're all living there, so they can do that, which means they wind up being closer to their roommate than their siblings by the time they graduate. So we have a lot of weddings between people at Olin. By the way, Olin is 50% women, so the gender balance works pretty well, uh, too. Um, they are, of course, like Michigan alumni would be, too, uh, very passionate advocates for their school wherever they work. And a very odd thing, I still don't understand this entirely, 50% of Olin's alumni, and they come from all 50 states and much of their countries, 50% of them live in two cities, uh, San Francisco or Seattle. And they didn't come from there, okay? Olin is in Boston. So um, there's something interesting going on there. We're still trying to learn. That's about all I can tell you, just off the top of my head. Yeah. Yes? Um, I was actually reading uh, the mindset book. Yes. I was listening to it, and it talked about the growth um, component of it, and it talked about the character of the individual. Yes. They give examples about um, Michael Jordan. is one of the components to, to help you to become that growth mindset, and you can change to become a growth mindset. Um, when we look at the younger generation nowadays and how um, people are being raised nowadays and building that character, um, and so many different social media and everything that's happening, and I, I know that there's a lot of situations where kids are not really spending that time with their parents or siblings and, and peers to be able to grow in that mindset. Um, have there been any studies for the um, um, earlier school ages where it talks about how the students are being raised, you know, like for that growth mindset? So when we get them, they come with that growth mindset? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. wouldn't that be nice if that were? Um, there, Stanford is doing a lot of work in this, as you probably know. Carol has a whole team of faculty that are working on K-12 education in that area. And the whole area of character education has become quite large. Um, there are a number of people who are doing good work in that. One of them that comes to mind is um, Howard Gardner's group at Harvard. Uh, they have uh, a group called, it used to be called the Good Work Project. Uh, it was about ethics and character in the workplace. And now it's just called the Good Project. Because if it's like, it's not just about work, man, this is bigger than that. Um, he has a, a really, I think, telling op-ed in the Washington Post in September of 2017. And I, it's, the title is something like, What We Are No Longer Teaching Our Kids. Okay, so, and they've been doing this 40-year longitudinal study at Harvard. One of the things that he found, and it's a societal culture thing, he said, um, and I'm, this is rough paraphrase because I can't remember it exactly. But he, he said, today, if your child in the third grade gets the highest grade in the class on the math test, the parent is likely to you know, rent a bouncy castle and a pony and bright, bring the whole community together to celebrate my kid is on the way to Wall Street. Okay? On the other hand, if your kid wins the uh, citizenship award, you know, the most appreciated student in the third grade, parent is likely to say, go do your math homework. Um, it used to be more important in America to be seen as uh, a, a builder of community, somebody who cared about others, not just self. And there seems to have been an erosion of that all over to one edge that all that really matters now is that you outperform the other person and you get the honors, not them. Um, it's a societal uh, concern. What to do about it? I'm not sure. Um, I know there are people that are doing really good work on it. There, I guess I would recommend one more book for you to read, which is really uh, good. It's a project happening at Stanford, um, which is called Designing Your Life. You know, has anybody heard about this? This is, came, came out of the D School. Um, Evans and Burnett are the, are the people who did it. They started out by dealing with um, graduates at Stanford who had not thought about, what do I do when I graduate? Okay. In fact, they have video of these kids who are practically collapsing with worry now that they're, they know how to do school, but they don't know what to do when they get out. At any rate, what they did is they took the principles of design thinking 
<clears throat> in applied psychology research, and they applied it to the problem of trying to identify a career path and a life path for you that makes um, that addresses all of your desires and your needs. Uh, so you have to think about who you are first and what it is you want to become. And then there's this whole process of how you make those decisions. So you, <clears throat> This has been ex, um, expanded and implemented at Wake Forest University, and I would highly recommend that you could talk to Rogan Kirsch there, at their, their provost, who's really quite good at it. Um, and they took, in fact, they hired the person from the Stanford Business School who was using this method to become uh, sort of the architect of a campus-wide program on character and purpose. And they look for, in the admission program, they look for students who have a, a desire to build a life of purpose, okay? They have, so in the essays, it's like, this is why I want to go to college. I want to become this kind of person. And then when they get there, there's this whole business, now you know what you want to become. What kind of an education is the best thing you should look for in order to get you there? And then when you get to the end and you're starting to look for employment, now you have this Designing Your Life book that comes out of Stanford for how to do that, how to make that sort of uh, decision. Um, there's also some people in England that have done a lot of this. Um, there's the Jubilee Center at Birmingham University, and Sir James Arthur is the guy's name um, that's done a lot of work there. And afterwards, I can talk with you more if you're interested in that. Have I exhausted you yet? <laughs> I'm amazed. You're still here. I thought for sure I'd lose half of you. Uh, yes? Where would you start? So how do you begin a transformation like that? Where would you start? We're uh, 9,000 to 300 students. Yeah, that's a really good question. H how do you make Understanding yourself, I imagine, with the first step. I, let me just answer that. I think you start with a strategic plan. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with the chancellor on that. Yeah. I mean, I've seen other institutions try to do things on a smaller scale, like what Olin does just in the engineering school. And I can tell you uh, what some of the experiences have been. Um, it's not at all a certainty that you can pull off change in an, in an established university. In fact, the more secure, the more respected, the higher prestige an institution has, the harder it is to make any sort of significant change. If the institution is desperate financially and you're willing to do anything to just survive, people are willing to try other things. So that's one. And I've seen, um, well, I won't mention names, but I've seen um, some universities say, well, the reason we're not doing this better is because we don't have the research. I mean, we're a research university, right? So if we had research, obviously we would slap our forehead with our palm and say, there's a better way. I'm going to start doing that on Monday. So since there is no research, there isn't any better way, so we're going to keep doing what we do. OK, we'll fix that. We'll create the research. And I know of, of a school that created a department for education research in their discipline to create the scholarship that would show you that there's a better way. Um, I wouldn't bet the farm that that will cause the change you're looking for. I'll tell you what happened when they created that department. The faculty members who were interested and concerned about education raised their hand and they relocated to the education department. And the other faculty said, well, good. Now we don't have to worry about education anymore. We can get back to the things that matter with science research. Okay, Didn't result in the change they wanted. It did produce some great scholarship, by the way. But absence of scholarship is not the reason why we're not doing things. Um, we have another group that actually did succeed. This was, I can tell you about this one because they wrote a book about it. This is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. They didn't say, let's create a department to create scholarship. They had a cross-cutting um, program, which they called the iFoundry, um, which any faculty member could join by raising their hand and say, I have an idea. It's gonna, it takes more than what I can do in my department. I have a partner over here. I'd like to have like um, a one course reduction in teaching next year, maybe a month of summer pay, and some students who are willing to try things that are new, and the ability to bypass the committee that doesn't allow you to try new courses, OK? Experimental courses, so just try it. Um, and that worked, OK? They, and there's a book called The Whole New Engineer. Um, a senior faculty member with an endowed chair, David Goldberg, was one of the co-authors of this book. So it worked there. Um, we're working with the University of Texas at El Paso, um, the largest Hispanic um, uh, engineering producing school that on the, in the country. 
completely different. Their admission criteria is they're an open university. You need to have a pulse rate and a high school diploma, and that's it. Um, and it's, it's doing amazing things. The, um, but the problem is it takes a clever dean, okay, because the dean had sequestered resources enough to create this new department, and then he was very careful about appointing people in that department who had the commitment to make this change happen. Um, another really good friend of mine um, at the other U of M at Ann Arbor tried to do this there, and when the department chairs found that he actually had resources to, to put faculty members in a new department, they said, no, 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 just give each one of us one of those, and we'll, we promise we'll make the same change happen in our departments, um, which you know, we're still waiting. Um, it's not easy <coughs> to make change happen. Um, I think, I mean, look at MIT. So MIT has a lot, MIT, as far as I'm concerned, has, um, there's a sample on the MIT campus somewhere of the best practice in engineering, education, research, and, and anything that you can think of. The problem is it's the United Nations of higher ed. Um, there's a joke in MIT. It says, where in Cambridge can you locate yourself to be the, in the farthest distance away from MIT? You know what it is? The Media Lab. And it's right in the middle of MIT because <laughs> it has nothing in common with the rest of the. So they created the Media Lab to, to, to inspire interdisciplinary research. Um, and it does, but the other departments didn't change, okay? Um, how did the D School get started at, at Stanford? It's a really interesting story. Um, it was not at all through knocking on the front door. They, they essentially were told, no, we don't need a D School. And uh, David Kelly, the founder, hasn't had a faculty appointment until just very recently. He's been there for 30 years. Um, he said, fine, um, I will do everything that you can't effect. I will offer courses that have no, no uh, course credit. I will not pay the faculty members. Okay? Um, we will not look for uh, disciplinary degrees at all. Now try and stop it. Okay? <laughs> you can't cut off my budget because I don't have one. Um, the students came out of the woodwork um, because the, what they were doing was transformative. And it eventually became uh, so popular that I think they're designing your life course now. It's like one of the most popular courses that Stanford has ever had. Um, and it sort of happened in spite of the organization of the university. Now they're kind of proud of it, so they're sort of moving it in. They actually have a couple of faculty positions now um, in the D school. Change is a very unusual thing. The easiest way on principle is to start with a blank sheet in an institution that doesn't exist. That's what I thought, okay? Turns out that's fraught with a lot of dangers, too, that you had never seen. Um, so I'm seeing this happen in lots of other countries. Um, and, and so there isn't a guarantee. I still, think, um, I still think Buckminster Fuller is right. The way you make change is that you create a model somewhere on your campus that works, that works so profoundly that people can come and kick the tires, and you, you just can't believe it. It's actually working. They don't have. Miracles, the people are normal. They have two hands and two feet. They walk on the ground. They eat like everybody else. But look what they can do. Um, and then people will begin to believe. So I wish I had the formula. Yes? So you talked a lot about how faculty with this growth mindset really impact students with growth mindset. Yes. I'm curious at Owen, how do you integrate the staff in this transformative process? Yeah, that's a really important question. How do you integrate the staff into this? Well, number one, we've decided that all of these titles that we have in this pecking order uh, for faculty is a, pro is a bad thing. So, um, we, so when we have a faculty meeting, we call it an academic life meeting, and all of the faculty and all of the staff, including the people in the shop, uh, anybody who touches students, people in the library, the dean of student life, residential life, the dean of admission, all of them are in the room at the same time. Um, and we don't have academic departments at Olin, so we don't have the physics group over here and the English guys over there. The only thing they have in common is the educational experience of the students. We have two retreats a year, one in January and one in June. And the only thing that the retreat is about is to learn what is working well and what is yet to be done. We just had a retreat in January, and the faculty um, after two days of hand-wringing and talking about this with the staff, 
concluded that the problem was we're not putting enough emphasis on character that somebody had pointed out before. We need to start talking about doing good in the world. And actually, we were a bit intimidated by the problem that Facebook has having with producing software that's so powerful that's addictive for your kids. And it may have a role, we don't know for sure, but it may have a role in mental health uh, for our young people. Um, how Do you feel good about that, spending your whole life doing that? Have you left Olin? Maybe we should have some psychologists in the room when we're designing the uh, software. Maybe we need to think differently about what it means to do good in the world. Maybe we should just not do some things if they're going to not do good. Where are they going to learn that? So we now have um, a new initiative at the school in embedding character and ethics in everything in all four years. But it's very nascent. So I don't know how it will work out. Um, staff are really critically important. I'd like to see more staff actually teach, um, not just be uh, people who take notes. Yes? Um, how do you uh, subtract and maintain that 50% of the energy of the human body? And tell us more about the demographics of your faculty who can do this and when you don't want to yeah. do stuff like that. Yeah, so our student body has been 50 50 from the beginning. Our faculty, who are almost all out of almost 50 faculty, we have maybe five that are not science, math, or engineering. <clears throat> and they're at least 45% women. <clears throat> It's not, um, it's not easy. It comes with a lot of uh, deliberate intention. It's not that different than I think you would say if you were at Amherst College or a liberal arts school that would like to have a roughly gender balanced community. Um, you don't get exactly gender balanced people. Our admission in applications, in our um, admission process is quite different. Uh, we were guided a lot by Howard Gardner um, at Harvard the um, multiple intelligence guy, who basically says everybody has at least seven different intelligences. Only two of them can be measured on the SAT. So what do you do about the other five? And we decide you can't, those, they're really important. <laughs> Interpersonal intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence, creativity, and so on. It actually has a bigger impact on your career than what your math score was. So you have to meet them. That's what we concluded. You, you have to meet them. It's the same thing you do when you hire a faculty member. You don't just look at the resume. You actually meet them. Why do that if everything you need is just on their test scores? Um, that's logistically, though, it's hard. So what we did is we wound up with um, creating what we call Candidates Weekend. Every student that's admitted to Olin goes through Candidates Weekend. So uh, I'll just march you through. We have about 1,000 applications. We're going to take 65 kids, OK? Because um, there's some that did a gap year, so they're coming in anyway. The incoming class size is 84. Um, we, we weed it down to about 200 who are amazing kids. I mean, there's a lot of self-selection goes on now. I mean, these kids have the test scores. So in fact, the kids on the wait list that don't get invited to the candidates weekend often have perfect 800 math scores on their, it's on the wait list. They didn't get in. Um, so once they come to the candidates weekend, we seal the records, and we have no idea now what, what your grades were, what you, you know, it's about an interview. And it's actually not an interview in the sense, when I think of interview, I think you put on a tie, you sit across the table from the chancellor and I talk about thermodynamics, OK? No, that's not what we do. Uh, we put them in teams of five as soon as they arrive that never met before, and they stay together the whole weekend. The first thing they do is design and build things together. Um, there's a project that our kids invent that's silly, that usually is impossible, that they have to do for four hours in a kind of a contest. Uh, breaks the ice, gets across the point, it's about teams, and it's about making things. The next thing we do, the same team, now that they kind of know each other, put them in a room, and we test their ability to deal with controversy. Like um, a couple years ago, our project was we drew a question out of a hat. What do you think about the Iraq War? Okay, uh, It's not that there's a right answer, but every member of your group has to speak and you have 15 minutes to develop a five-minute presentation, go. And we sit in the back of the room and watch. Um, a lot's at stake in this, right, whether you get this $100,000 scholarship. Then there is the final thing, which is an individual question, you know, bringing you in for oral exam one at a time with three people of our community. That's really about what does it mean to live a good life. Um, and we're looking for passion. 
We're looking for something that matters. Um, nobody gets into Olin that doesn't have a passion about making a positive impact somewhere in the world. It's not about money. By the way, one of the things I'm really proud of at Olin, unlike other engineering schools that I found, in all the years we've been doing this, um, a, a total of 2% of our alumni have gone to work on Wall Street. Um, they're not interested in that. They want to make things that change people's lives. Um, at the end of that two days, um, the three people that we embed in the group of five for the whole weekend <laughs> huddle, and they have to independently assess them. You know, are they a one, a two, or a three? If they're a one, you, you know, well, why bother with the college degree? Let's just hire them on the faculty. I mean, these people are amazing. Um, if there are three, what were you thinking? I mean, this is like never going to work. And so all the discussion goes around the twos. You know, just some strengths and some weaknesses. What do you think? That's how you balance the class. And gender is one of the things they take into account. First generation is another thing they take into account. Underrepresented minorities is another big push that we're, we're pushing forward at this point in time. Geographic diversity. You have a couple of kids from Alaska. Um, you've had some from Wyoming, Montana, one of our first um, groups. Um, so they come from rural America. They come from all over the place. That's, that's basically how our admission program works at this point in time. And it's a wet cement thing, too. We're talking about changing it. One of the problems with it that I really am disappointed in, <clears throat> we have a hard time getting a, a critical mass of underrepresented minorities, right? It's like 12 or 13% now. Um, there's a program, there's a lot of programs that really work. One of them is called Posse. You know about the Posse program? Um, I bet your admission person does. This is where you bring uh, about 10 together from the same town, from the same neighborhood, and they support each other. Because one of the things that's missing is coming from a family that doesn't have any background or understanding of higher ed, and it's awfully easy in a cynical educational environment to give up. And this, they, so you bring their family with them. That's the idea. We can't do that. We can't bring in a posse because 10 is a big divide out of our whole incoming class. Um, and they wouldn't be going through Candidates Weekend with individual. So um, it's a work in progress. I um, just want to thank, and, and there may be other questions, and you can send them to me, and I'd be happy to pass them on to Rick. But I, I do want to thank him very, very much because this 45 minute presentation went two hours. <laughs> <laughs> there was a great deal of interest here, and I want to give him a big round of applause.